Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston Literary Festival based in South Carolina, USA. I would like to welcome you from wherever in the world that you may be watching. If the past fraught 18 months has taught us anything, it has taught us that books and their authors, whether classical or contemporary, really matter. In trying times, readers turn to books for insights into the human condition, for the opportunity to be transported to other worlds, for ideas, for arguments, for inspiration, for experiencing the impossible, for laughter and for the release of tears. The festival will provide the opportunity to engage with a galaxy of literary and artistic stars, as well as up and coming writers who are making waves. We have a far flung cast list featuring authors from all over the United States, as well as the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Whether they're talking about former literary trailblazers or gene editing or human rights or popular culture or feminism or medieval nuns or innumerable other subjects, they have one thing in common, the ability of compelling stories to linger in our imaginations. We're grateful to all our speakers, whether virtual or in-person for sharing their talents. Please thank them by purchasing their books. The festival couldn't happen without a committed team and board. We would like to thank our donors, both private and public, who generously make the festival possible. The College of Charleston, our academic partner, has been an invaluable source of support. It's no accident that the festival takes place in Charleston, a prime destination with a progressive literary and artistic tradition. Please come and see for yourselves, but make sure to visit during the Charleston Literary Festival, which takes place during the first half of November each year. Meanwhile, I hope that you enjoy the 2021 Charleston Literary Festival and that it makes you think and dream afresh. It's my pleasure to welcome you from wherever you may be watching and to introduce two magnificent and multifaceted speakers, Edmund Duval and Tristram Hunt. Edmund Duval is an artist, master potter, and author of The Hair with Amber Eyes, which explored his family background by tracing the convoluted destiny of a collection of Japanese Netsuki. The White Road, which followed his journey through the history of porcelain, at Touchdown in Charleston, South Carolina, and most recently, Letters to Camondeau, a sequence of imagined letters to an early 20th century Parisian collector of beautiful objects who had close connections to his own ancestors. Tristram Hunt is director of the Victorian Albert Museum in London. He has served as a member of the English Parliament, representing the constituency in which the protagonist of his latest book, Josiah, Josiah Wedgwood, resided. Prior to that, he lectured on British history at the University of London and is the author of several books. His current publication, The Radical Potter, The Life and Times of Josiah Wedgwood, is a biography of the pioneering 18th century English designer, inventor, entrepreneur, and social reformer, whose enterprising spirit stretched as far as Charleston in South Carolina. Edmund de Vaughan and Tristram Hunt, both men of many parts, as you've heard, will discuss their shared interest in ceramics and the history and resonance of objects. Diana, thank you very, very much indeed. And uh, greetings from um, the Victoria and Albert Museum um, in South Kensington. And Edmund, where are you today? I'm in my studio in South London, very much less glamorous, Tristram, than your office, <laughs> I'm afraid. I think you brought him as much pottery as we do that. Um, <laughs> I thought we'd begin um, this afternoon, and it's a delight to be uh, talking to uh, colleagues at the Charleston um, Festival with this remarkable connection between um, Josiah Wedgwood, porcelain, um, the hunt for the, the great white clay, and of course, South Carolina, because one of Wedgwood's more esoteric connections with uh, North America was this great mystery of the Cherokee clay, which emerged in the 
sixties. Edmund, what 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 drew him out towards South Carolina? Well, I mean, it's the thing that draws us around the world, Tristram, which is this obsessional quest for white gold, for kaolin, for china clay, for this extraordinary material that, uh, you know, is really alchemical. It, it, it starts out as one thing and can be made into something completely other. So, you know, this is the great history of, 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 of the quest, you know, and it, and it begins, well, it, it begins elsewhere, but um, we'll tell that story together, I think, today. But, 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 but by the time we get to Charleston, I think we'll be well underway with this, uh, with, with actually with the idea of obsession, the dangers of obsession. And, and uh, talking about Wedgwood is always, well, talking about Potters is always good to talk about obsession, but Wedgwood, we, when we get to Wedgwood, I think we'll, we'll be on fire, I hope, Tristram. But I mean, maybe maybe I can start by 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 sort of sketching. If we can have the first slide, please. I mean, this is where I am. This is this is my studio, and and if you go up one staircase in my studio, you find the wheel, and then ne the next slide. Hope if you if you got the next, it's books. <laughs> so it, it's porcelain and books, and the next slide. And so one of my shelves in my studio is full of shards. It's full of these broken bits of, of, of pottery. Um, um, I'm, you can hear them clinking away in the background. And so in some ways, the, my, my journey, uh, and I write on walls, um, the next slide, Hope, you know, is, is, is really a, a journey through obsession. It's a journey to try and understand why, you know, I'm a middle-aged Englishman, why for 50 years of my 57 years, I've been obsessed by porcelain. Um, I, I, and here you just see what happens. This is basically my, my, my midlife crisis journey, I suppose, um, Tristram. So I, I, I start to make lists of the places I need to go. And, and where I start for this journey, obsessional quest for porcelain is China. Um, and if we can have the next slide, I, I go to Jingdezhen, a, a city where China, where, where Marco Polo has seen porcelain uh, being made. And, and I, I go off to a mountain, which is the mountain for white clay. And there, halfway up the mountain, I look down and there are, are, are broken pieces of, of Sung Dynasty porcelain under my feet. And I'm sort of in tears. It's my great moment. And then everyone's laughing at me because if you see the next slide, you'll see that actually the whole of the hillside, the whole of this landscape is broken porcelain. Porcelain goes wrong. That's the thing we'll come back to. Uh, uh, and so this journey, and you see the next two slides is, is, is this extraordinary city. It's a city of potters, a city of poverty. Um, and we're again, something we need to talk about, the social history of how this stuff is made. Um, and, and, and people talk um, um, throughout the centuries of the fact that the city is a, a nightmare during the day because of the belching um, um, flames from the kilns and at, uh, and at night it's terrifying too. And when you go there uh, and you see uh, the next couple of slides will show you hope, you know, along these alleyways, there are people still making quantities of porcelain. You know, and when you look into the alleyways, you look into the back streets, if you see the next slide, this is really instructive. You see people um, ankle deep in white dust, in the white dust of porcelain. And of course, you know, that's part of the story of the people who make these beautiful things. The cost of making uh, this material is extreme. What do you end up with? You end up, here's a beautiful um, um, Ming Dynasty urn, um, a monk's cap ewer. You can see these things and why you might obsess about them. And of course, people collect them in Europe. People collect them in Europe, they're obsessed about them and they can't work out how to make them. And amongst all the people who are trying desperately to navigate how to make porcelain um, are, are people in Dresden. Dresden is important because it's this beautiful, extraordinary city uh, with Augustus the Strong. Here he is in his pomp. You can see this uh, great uh, a man who is obsessional about porcelain. He has, he says, la maladie de porcelaine, porcelaine krankenheit, 
Um, uh, he, he loves porcelain so much that he wants to, to sail ships down the Elbe, all the way down um, around the world to collect Chinese porcelain. But in fact, what he does is he brings people together and he locks them in this extraordinary fortress in Meissen. Um, and here we have the, the Meissen fortress. Um, and here are two people in these great vaults. If you go down and see this extraordinary next slide, you see these, these dungeons. And these are the places where two people, an alchemist called Bertger, who is a young man who's been promised that he could turn uh, lead into gold, the alchemist's dream, and a great philosopher called Chernhaus are locked together in this sort of death rattle of trying to make porcelain. And you look at their notes, if you look at this extraordinary notebooks, the years and the decades they spent, the decade they spent trying to do it, you finally find this particular page in their notebooks. And here in this notebook, you see uh, that the moment they open this kiln deep in these, this terrible toxic space, and you see that album et pellucidum, number seven, album et pellucidum, they found something which is white and translucent. Uh, and the next slide shows you what they found. They found the secret of porcelain. Actually, I have rather fantastically here, show and tell time, um, um, a piece of porcelain which was made the following year. And uh, I better not drop it, but you can hear the gloriousness of this, of this porcelain. This is not one of yours, Tristram, from the VNA. This is actually one of my pieces of porcelain. And you look at the next slide and you see the crossed rapiers, um, which say this is my. So this is how porcelain is brought back into Europe, by, through obsession, through money, through state funding. An elector of Saxony is doing it. And everyone tries to copy. Everyone wants to have porcelain. Every country, every court, um, every factory wants to produce uh, uh, porcelain. But then the story, and this is where we're, going to, we're getting towards Wedgwood here, Tristram, uh, for me begins again um, with um, a very humble chemist, um, here we are in his, his London uh, house where he becomes an apothecary. He's called William Cookworthy. The next slide shows you he's a, an unassuming hero, rather um, 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 portly. Uh, and he sends, he, he, he descends, uh, he creates a, 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 an apothecary's workshop in Plymouth, which is um, one of the English cities which is... is, is um, there's not a lot going on in the 18th century in Plymouth. Let me, let me put it like that. And according to this notebook, it rains all the time. Uh, and he's a great autodidact. This is so important when you think about all the different people who make porcelain. Here's William Cookworth, he's an autodidact. He, he's Quaker, you know, always good for, for working hard Quakers. And he has a horse called Prudence. You can't really make this up. So you imagine the Quaker chemist, his horse Prudence, and, and what he does is he walks uh, to take his pills and, and lotions across um, the Devon and Cornwall hillside. And, and you see this next slide. This is, this is the geology of the spaces, of, of the, the, the landscape he looks he, under his feet. So here we have, we have this, this um, Quaker apothecary, and he, he's read about, my, uh, about porcelain. He knows that it's white stone, and he looks under his feet. Here's the next slide on a Cornish hillside, Tr Tregoning Hill. And here I am on the same hill. He looks down and he finds white stone. What does he do? He takes it back to his modest um, 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 uh, workshop. And then this begins, you look at the next slide, you see all these archival things. He, he does this, he makes notes, uh, he builds a kiln. The next slide shows you his kiln. It's disastrous. What happens, the next slide, you can see uh, samples of the biscuit of the last kiln. He's desperately trying to work out how to bring all these things together. And then gloriously, March the 14th, 1768, the next slide, he makes a mug out of porcelain. So this isn't some fine, enormous Meissen teapot. It's a beer mug. I mean, could you get more kind of English in this story than that? March the 14th, 1768, CF, Cookworthy, fake it. I made it, Cookworthy made it. And, and in cobalt, 
um, on, on uh, the decoration is the arms of Plymouth, the coats of arms of Plymouth in cobalt, and it's running. He's not very good at what he does. And there he is in his next slide, showing you his slightly in despair reading scripture. And then he makes a great mistake. The next slide, he tries to take out a patent. William Cookworthy of Plymouth, chemist, for the sole use and exercise of a discovery of certain materials for making porcelain in order to enable Richard Champion of Bristol Merchant to make this porcelain. So here we have Cookworthy and we have Champion, who's a, a man in a hurry from Bristol and Champion we'll come back to. And this is where we meet Wedgwood. So tell us Tristram Hunt about what's happening at this moment with Wedgwood and why Wedgwood should be interested in this portly Plymouth chemist and this particular attempt to control these materials. Edmund, thank you. What a, what a fantastic account uh, of, of the white road uh, and, 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 and the hunt for whiteness. So Josiah Wedgwood um, is, is born in 1730 in North Staffordshire into a pottery uh, family. The, the Wedgwoods have been making potteries for uh, a good couple of centuries on the North Staffordshire, South Cheshire borders in the, in the north of England. Um, and they have been moderately successful, moderately uh, prosperous. Um, and all seems set for young Josiah Wedgwood to continue into the uh, family firm. Um, and then some important um, developments take place. First of all is the um, terrible smallpox, uh, which runs through um, North Staffordshire um, in the 1740s. And Wedgwood is afflicted by this. Um, and during the course of the fever, his, his leg is terribly weakened. And when he emerges from the fever, um, he has lost power in his leg in a sense to tread the treadle that he cannot be a thrower of pottery because he hasn't got the power in his leg to turn the potter's wheel. And so he becomes a, a great thinker about pottery, becomes someone who's very interested, like Cookworthy, and they share a non-conformist background in experimentation. Um, and some of this is related to this, this Protestant uh, religion about the revelation of God's mystery through the natural world, through experimentation um, and discovery. He's also part of this great sort of epoch of discovery of thinking about how Europe can respond to exactly what Edmund charted, which was the incredible beauty and wonder and volume of porcelain coming out uh, of China, coming out of Jing Zhen. Um, and we see in Holland um, the growth of Delftware uh, as a response to the blue and white ware uh, coming out um, of China and their response to the market. And then we see with um, uh, Augustus the creation um, of these, these state-run uh, porcelain man manufactories, similarly uh, in France and many of the other German principalities. But in Britain, there is a different response. First of all, there isn't this great kind of state court royal uh, um, control or funding of uh, the response to porcelain. Secondly, you have this much more free market approach, much more um, kind of low level um, individual um, separate designer makers, manufacturers seeking to respond to it. And Cookworthy responds by finding the secret of porcelain through uh, exactly as Edmund uh, pointed out, the incredible white clays um, of Cornwall. But Wedgwood's response um, to the challenge of porcelain was not to go down the road of the incredible expense and the financial precariousness and the obsession um, and the malady of porcelain and the illness of porcelain, his response is to create what would be called creamware, which was an earthenware rather than a porcelain, which had some of the lightness of porcelain, but had none of the expense 
or in a sense the drama, or actually the great stunning translucent beauty of it. And so Wedgwood, in a sense, is responding to the challenge uh, of China from China with a much more earthy, uh, easier to manufacture, and ultimately, as we'll see during the coming years, um, a, um, a, 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 a more amenable product um, for, for export around the world. But in a sense, Edmund, everyone is responding to China, both as a kind of geopolitical force in the 18th century, but also as this great design force. And we see, I think, in, in, in the different responses of, of the German states or France or Britain, something of the politics and culture of those different countries. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, there are, I mean, you've actually got some extraordinary images, actually, of, of, of if we actually saw some of those images, perhaps if we could move to slide 31, actually, Tristram, you could actually just talk um, to, um, I mean, this, this, this surely <laughs> tells you so much, doesn't it, Tristram, about, um, uh, about exactly about, uh, uh, about place and, and meaning in, in, in the ceramics of, of Wedgwood. Could, could you, you, this, this sort of, this particular <laughs> object tells you about, about, about the geography of power uh, and taste, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't that, isn't this, t t this, tell us about the frog service, tell us about this image, why this matters. It unpacks so much. So th th this is a fantastic image. So, mm. so what we see here is, is a great example of um, Wedgwood's design skill, marketing skill, sense of uh, uh, politics and power explored through um, ceramics. So the frog service um, was designed for Empress Catherine the Great of Russia. And Wedgwood was always very good at ensuring that his wear attracted the interest of what he called the legislators in taste, uh, that those who would define the market. Today we would call them the, the kind of the influencers um, of the day. And so he focused very much um, on, for example, Queen Charlotte of England, the wife of King George III. And when she started buying his creamware, he started to call it Queensware uh, and defined himself and uh, sold himself as you know, Potter to Her Majesty. It's a very good line. It's a very good line. I know, I know. Yes, it's, yeah. a, it's a very good top branding. Yes. Um, and, and actually, you know, mm -hmm. we saw the back stamp uh, from Augustus Rex in terms of the mice yeah. and pottery. Wedgwood was very fastidious that he, mm -hmm. in, in ensuring that his brand identity uh, was stamped um, on his pottery. But then he caught the attention um, of Empress Catherine the Great. And Catherine the Great was this, this modernizing figure uh, within uh, Russia, and she wanted to reform Russia, and she was a great Anglophile. And what she wanted was for a kind of exploration and celebration of the idea of Great Britain as a call to arms, as a, yes. as a force for change within Russia. And so she commissioned Wedgwood to provide an account of mid 18th century Britain through a dinner service. And it was called the Frog Service because um, one of her palaces was surrounded by a marshy uh, landscape uh, full of frogs. And you can see on the top of this plate, uh, the frog uh, sitting there. And this is Kew Gardens in, in London. Um, and you can see on the right, um, the, the celebration of a kind of neoclassical ideal with a Roman uh, temple. And then as you look through the middle um, of, of the vista, of this, of this very carefully constructed vista, you see a Chinese pagoda. And so on this kind of celebration of Great Britain in ceramic form, you have this sort of genuflection to the civilization of China, which actually Wedgwood wanted to kind of take on and challenge their dominance uh, through his uh, through his ceramic work. It, and it was I a mean, huge success. It's a huge success. It's also absolutely extraordinary because you look at this and of course, there you have absolutely right. You've got neoclassical stuff. You've got Chambers, I think it's Chambers' pagoda, uh, a bit, uh, bit, bit of chinoiserie at the end. Uh, and it's England, but it's also Kew Gardens. So you've also got 
This is, this is England sending people out around the world and, and mapping and collecting the natural world and bringing it back uh, because only England can do this. Only England can have a scientific garden which represents the whole of the world. So you've got Wedgwood sending his ceramics all the way around the world. And as you said, you know, sending them indeed to the Chinese court, rather unhappily actually, but sending them there, selling them to em the em empress of, oh my God, I mean, extraordinary to, 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 to Petersburg. But, but all these images are images of power and control and civilization. So here we have different levels of sort of engagements with place, don't we? We have a, you know, a very, modest uh, chemist sort of walking walking across a hill trying to find stone and we've got but we have we have Wedgwood asking um Cook to bring back white clay from from Australia is that right absolutely and and, and also to 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 to, to connect, connect back to to Charleston that yeah. one, one of the one of the kind of sort of marketing uh, gimmicks that, that Wedgwood wanted, uh, not for the for frog service, but some of the other work, was to suggest that the clay had mm. come from the Cherokee settlements, had can, come can, from can, the reservations. Yeah. Can, can, um, can, 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 can I can I take you on this journey actually? Yes. Because uh, I, you know, I'm slightly obsessional, as you actually know. Known each other for really quite a long time, and so when I read about the, this story about Cherokee clay, that that Wedgwood who hears everything, that's my view of Wedgwood. He hears that, that, that the Cherokees have got white clay. I decide I'm gonna go and find this place. So if we have a slide 34, please. Um, you know, this is the Badlands at this moment. You know, it's really quite a rough area. And so he sends um, a sort of ne'er-do-well um, adventurer who he's discovered called Thomas Griffiths off into the Appalachian Mountains, into Cherokee country. Uh, uh, image 35, the next slide, please. And so I, I, um, um, I took my son out of school. He was, um, he was uh, 15 um, uh, for an adventure. And we, 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 I told him we were, this was school work of a kind. We drove, we had a kind of, we, we, we got a big American car. We put country and Western music on, wrong place, but never mind. We drove into these mountains, Appalachian mountains, and we found, we found the next slide. We followed where Wedgwood had sent this um, adventure, Griffiths, uh, and the next slide. And what had happened was that Griffiths had found a particular sacred site, a particular hillside where Kaelin, where, where white, this white rock was being used by the Cherokee Indians for sacred rituals, for sacred rites. And there he persuaded them that he would buy five tons of this white clay. And you have the next slide, like there's still some there, <laughs> me with white clay in my hand. And he persuades them he, he, and he says, I'm gonna bring you back uh, a porcelain punch bowls. I'm gonna bring you back riches. Uh, and then he carts it off um, perilous journey all the way back uh, to Charleston and all the way back and then and then ships it back all the way across the world back to London and tells Wedgwood I've got it and then what happens well that's the moment of course Tristram that that, that, that Wedgwood starts using quotes Cherokee clay <laughs> in some of his most famous works and there are, these, there are these wonderful letters from Josiah mm. Wedgwood to his great business partner, Thomas yeah. Bentley, who's, who's this merchant, yeah. um, saying, you know, what do you think? Should you, do you think we need this backstory? Do you think we need this kind of, we'd call it today a brand narrative? Yes. Uh, <laughs> to, to, so that as you buy this dinner service, you are immediately connected uh, to this kind of fascinating, unknown, exotic land full in, 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 mm. in their sense of, uh, of, 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 of these unknown peoples, but you know, with great um, and interesting civilizations. Um, and in the end, they, they, they feel they don't need it um, uh, bec because the products were powerful enough um, themselves. But it's a, it's a very good example, both of kind of Wedgwood's global footprint and, and exactly as Edmund says, his, his great ability um, to the, the, to latch on to ideas and people and places, uh, but also that that great gift uh, for marketing uh, and that great gift 
for connecting the design with the brand, with the with the kind of social psychology um, mm. of the um, of the consumer. Um, but, 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 and when but, we think of yeah. way towards success, it's as it's yeah. as it's as much part of that uh, as it is uh, some of the um, the kind of technological developments. But 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 you call your book the Radical Potter, and if we see image forty, I think that you have to talk about this um, because you know you very to call a Potter radical. I mean, I I, I love it. You know, I mean, I. I'm up, I'm up for that. But, but talk, talk about this, but talk about the fact that he also sees not only um, um, as an entrepreneur, he sees the ability to change working conditions and living conditions and labor conditions and make himself very well off, of course, in, in the process. But he, can, he also sees um, the agency he has um, in terms of creating images to do quite radical acts. So talk about this. Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, again, I, I think I think so much of it goes back to the nonconformist inheritance and and um, with it, the, the idea of agency and 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 the sort of re the revelation of, um, of of God's plan within which kind of, you know, Wedgwood saw himself playing a part. Um, Wedgwood was a, a, a radical. He was a radical in transforming the practice of the production of pottery. He was a radical in terms of um, sort of uh, initiating many of the, the components of the Industrial Revolution, but he was also a political radical. So he was a supporter uh, of the, the 13 colonies um, and the American Revolution. Uh, he was a supporter of the French Revolution. He was the supporter of the rights of Parliament uh, against the the executive, against uh, uh, the king. Uh, and then he, sorry, sorry. He, he even makes a a plaque for the storming of the Bastille, doesn't he? He makes a plaque. In I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, this is so cool. I mean, you know, I come know, on. He, he, you know. he creates a, 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 a small button, a small medallion to, to, to celebrate the storming of the Bastille, even though he knows, you know, the French Revolution might lose his money. Yeah. Um, but, but his, his, his big moment is, mm. is coming to the conviction of the inhumanity and the evilness um, of the, the trade in enslaved um, Africans. And he joins the Committee for the Abolition um, of the Slave Trade. And we have a series of letters for him sort of exploring the, the, the moral wrongness of this, of this human trafficking. And he thinks, well, how can I, how can I assist in the abolition of this, um, and he gives them money, and and he works in, in you know on the committee. But above all, it's design; it's the power of design, and what he produces here in this wonderful uh, white jasper with black relief uh, medallion um, is one of the the most radical design objects in British history, yes. Yes. which is a a call to arms: Am I not a man and a brother? A celebration of humanity. Uh, a celebration of, of um, the, the, the need to end slavery. Um, and even if today we might think that the figure of the enslaved African um, is far more kind of submissive and almost penitential, actually at the time, this was a very, very powerful uh, uh, symbol. And people wore it everywhere. People wore it on, yes. on the... Yeah. Um, on their necklaces, uh, on their watches, um, on their, as, as buttons, um, on their clothes. And it was what we would call today virtue signaling. Mm. People were signaling their virtue and they were signaling their, their kind of rank hostility towards um, the, the slave trade. And it was a really important part of this big civil society campaign, which would lead up to the abolition uh, of the trade of slaves um, in 18. And Wedgwood becomes more radical. He becomes yes. convinced that this will end and the importance mm. of it. And so putting design in, in the kind of um, in, in, in motion uh, for this, this story of liberation is profoundly important. And there's this it's, lovely it's, letter from Thomas Clarkson saying that fashion, fashion which was once, you know, uh, uh, an act of sort of flippancy and frippery now became this great moral cause um and it shows Widward using the kind of luxury trade and the fashion trade for these radical outcomes it's extraordinary because if you if you imagine i mean this is still so uncommon i mean this is this is glorious 
because here you have someone who is hugely well off and is being painted by stubs and is you know has an estate and 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 but retains you know uh au fond this this this, this absolute pulse of of, of non the, of non-conformity, which actually is about equality, is actually about seeing the otherness of other people. You know, and as you say, he gets more radical, you know, which doesn't normally happen, which is not the normal trajectory of people. I mean, I mean, you know, so, you know, the radical Potter, how do we square this though? Um, if we can see image uh, 43 and then 44, how do we square this with with the, with the the, the 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 smoking kilns of of Stoke on Trent, this is your old uh, this is your old constituency, um, Stoke on Trent, fresh air from the potteries. It's a quotes joke postcard from 1900. How do we square what do we square this idea of of ceramics as a um, a, uh, as a of the, there being a possibility of ra of, of radical change agency possibility with this and also the next image which is of children you know the labor of this is teenage young teenage children working in actually quite clean conditions actually for, for, for stoke how do we how do we add all this up because for me this it, it's 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 fissile it doesn't fit together it's profoundly disquieting history I, th I think that's exactly right. And there's, there's, first of all, there's always this tension in Stoke that, um, and, and when J.B. Priestley went to Stoke on Trent in the, in the 1930s, he says, you know, just focus on what comes out of the ovens. Don't look anywhere else. Mm. Um, and the challenge was always kind of, you know, how such beauty emerges from such ugliness um, and, um, and, 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 and such kind of industrial, uh, uh, such an industrial setting. And yet Wedgwood, is both this, this great radical belief, believing in human dignity um, and campaigning against the slave trade, you know, for better working conditions. And yet he unleashes through his mechanization of production, through his belief in conveyor belt uh, systems of the making of pottery, through the stripping out in many ways of individual creativity of his workers. He wanted to make machines of the men such as cannot earn. Yes, I know, um, I know. It's a terrible know. kind of I vision know. of the kind of yeah. robots yeah. and automation um, yeah. of, um, of production. And, and that's why the, the kind of, the, you know, the Bloomsbury critique of, of, of Wedgwood um, is that actually he, 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 did, he did so much damage in terms of art and craft and design uh, in Britain, because even though he was this design genius um, and, this, um, and this business kind of guru and this, this remarkable figure, actually the consequences of the, the, the almost the, the automation, the mechanization, the stripping out of creativity was in the long run deleterious. Um, for uh, uh, manufacturing. And I, you know, there, there, there are pros and cons to that, that argument. Wedgwood himself was, you know, keen on, you know, decent working conditions, built houses for his workers, you know, Etruria, where uh, manufacturing was based, always had this very strong kind of club, social society, you know, a sense of life beyond work. But there's no doubt, I think, I think you're right, Edmund, um, that the the kind of long-term impact and that that you know that pottery vision of kind of low paid low wage work particularly uh, for women uh, and children was one of the consequences but, and it is a but, but, right. but you know we, we 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 need to take objects with the seriousness that allows ambiguity about how they're constructed how they're owned the agency of them like can, can i tell you can i just tell you another bit of a story here uh, trust me, if we have the next slide, because this is this sort of follows on really from this is this is a 1930s exhibition of industrially produced uh, white porcelain in in uh, which was part of an early um, just after the Weimar Republic had collapsed. This is an exhibition in Berlin, you know, and this is porcelain which is constructed very much in keeping with with the whiteware with with what Wedgwood unleashed and when I saw this you know this is you know this is what the future looked like but but when I investigated this more I discovered 
another terrible kind of coda to this obsession with beautifully made white objects, you know, this purity, um, because actually I started to discover that there was a factory that I'd never heard of in Germany around this time, um, just outside Munich called Allach. And if I can have the next slide, please, just, just bear with me because this is a terrible coda to all this. Um, and a coda really to the Meissen story because I went, you know, on one of my journeys, endless journeys to find the place where this Allach porcelain factory was based and it's down a nowhere suburban street. The next slide, um, please, it's, there it is. And there's a big sign saying, you know, do not cross, don't enter. So of course I climb over and break into the factory. This is, I shouldn't be telling this to the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, but this is an extraordinary and painful place because this is a porcelain factory that is set up and owned by Heinrich Himmler. This is the place where they decide that they're going to make beautiful, pure, white, Aryan porcelain, because porcelain has to be German, and make it in quantities. And they start here on the suburb of Munich, and then, tragically, they move to the next slide. They move their production to the Dachau concentration camp. And here in this camp, they produce porcelain with slave labor. Uh, on the next slide, they, 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 they sell it. This is in one of the occupied territories in, 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 in 1943. Uh, uh, and the next slide, and, and in the camp, dignitaries come and see porcelain being made. Uh, and the next slide. And, and here they are, this is members of the SS choosing good white crockery. And they also make figurines, the next slide. And here um, are, are figurines that are made only for the commandants of, of concentration camps. And here, uh, the next slide. Um, and, and the next slide, you know, here is Hitler being given Alech porcelain, which is made in Dachau uh, for a Christmas present. I, I go there, I find the archives, and then I'm shown um, Tristram, this object. Now, this is an interesting object because here we have this porcelain object. Wait for it. Here we go. Have a look at this. It is Bambi made out of porcelain. You turn it over, and there is the Meissen mark of the two rapiers turned into the SS symbol. Um, and we see it again in close up here. And so what you have is this history of obsession um, with all its extraordinary and painful um, um, fallout, because actually, you know, people want white objects. They want things which are well made and actually how those are made and what stories those things tell. This is a story about national identity, about owning a, owning, um, a history. <laughs> You know, and so, you know, this is painful stuff, but this is all part of object history that we have to look at with you know, unflinchingly, don't we, Tristan? We, we can't ignore this fallout, this kind of part of, part of the history of, of, of objects. No, I think I, and, and, and it's sort of, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of shuddering the, 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 the kind of, where these levels of production end, still mm. the allure of white and the meaning of white, and it takes on clearly different connotations yes. about purity um, um, with uh, the Nazi era. And then how interesting the, man the manipulation, the grotesque manipulation uh, of, of the brand and, and, and the, the kind of, uh, that initial idea of, uh, of um, of creative success becoming, in a sense, this 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 symbol of of, of, of grotesque supremacy. Yeah. But Edmund, your your work has always been to, to go back to your your studio. This 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 exploration of the power of the object and the connection with with the written word. You've explored it through incredibly. Um, the hair with amber eyes in terms of the Netsukis flowing through the history uh, of uh, your family and the way in which those 
objects and the lives of those objects uh, uh, assume uh, different forms uh, with different generations in, in different parts of the world. And then your, your latest work takes on this thinking and connects not least um, to this, this history of, of European uh, loss of disintegration through objects. Tell us about the letters. Tell us about the letters. Well, 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 well I mean, here we are. The next slide probably locates us, actually. Um, we're in Paris. We're on the Rue de Monceau. It's, it's a beautiful street where my Parisian Jewish family live, 10 doors along. And this is the house of the, uh, 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 another Jewish family from Constantinople, the Commando family, arrive in the same moment, become assimilated, exactly the same movement of from one place, Odessa in my, uh, my family's case, Constantinople in their case, they become perfect Parisians. And Moise de Camondo, this very civilized, um, 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 interesting um, member of the family, um, if we can see image 60, please. Um, he builds a beautiful house. He fills it with 18th century furniture and art because that is the moment he thinks that French Parisian society is most civilized. It's the moment he recognizes that the Jews are given citizenship. It's the first European country to give citizenship to the Jews. And he's a great believer in the enlightenment. He, he, he wants to believe that he can have a dinner table when, with Voltaire at one end of the table. And he, he loves the idea of, of this. Um, and he creates his house uh, and it's full of treasures. Um, he creates it and he, for his son, his son dies in the great war. Seem. And at that moment, he decides that he's going to create this house, make it into a memorial for his son. And that's what he does. 1935, he dies, and the house is gifted, extraordinary gift, to the French state. And then, 1940, the Wehrmacht walk in, Vichy France, you know what happens. All those edicts, you know, the stripping away of of, 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 of all the human rights and dignity, the wearing of the yellow star, the dispossession of people from their possessions, from their houses, from their families. And in 1942, his daughter Beatrice, her husband, who is a cousin of my grandmother's, and their two children are, are, are taken to an internment camp, guarded by French policemen, Drancy in Paris. And then they're deported to Auschwitz and they are murdered. So they are, this house, this gift to France, this gift of gratitude for, 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 for the accommodation uh, of, of a, a Jewish family into Parisian society becomes this extraordinary, powerful, mesmeric place because it hasn't changed since 1936 when it was opened as a museum. And God help me. Tristram, I was invited to do something in this house, the first artist, first person to do anything since 1936. And so there I am, I'm in the attics, I'm looking and finding things and being in these spaces. These are spaces I know very well. Um, I, I, and what do I do? I, I, I write letters to him, it turns into a book. <laughs> um, he doesn't write back, that's the real <laughs> um, And then just last week, you know, there I was putting things for just for these few months into the spaces. Can we see slide 62, please? Um, um, I start to put a few things into the space, um, into these corridors, these servants' quarters, uh, which are sort of hidden away. Um, oak vitrines with, with pots full of broken objects. Um, could we see, um, the, just run through, please, run through the next slides. Um, 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 and what I've done, and it sort of, it sort of makes sense to me. It might not make sense to anyone else. Is that I've, I've hidden objects in the house. You know, I've put things in drawers. I've put broken shards into cupboards. Um, I've, um, I've sort of repopulated the house. Um, in ways that I that I wanted to. Um, these are the silver drawers 
um, which were full, filled with the family silver. I've, I've put porcelain uh, pieces of, of, of very thin translucent gilded porcelain into the drawers. And then finally, upstairs in the attics, um, where you open things and there are Louis Vuitton trunks from 1930s still there and Louis Carroll's chairs. I've, I've put objects in and I close the doors again. <laughs> so I'm saying this is uh, um, an installation that, that, that is about, re, about bringing the family back into this house. And then one installation outside in the beautiful spaces outside the house, if you just run through the next ones, um, you'll know, Tristram, very well that in Berlin and in many German cities, there are um, Stolpersteine, these, these stumble stones, these little markers. We stop here, um, these little markers for showing where families have been deported, where they lived. And that doesn't happen in Paris. You know, you can walk through Paris, you can walk down this street and not know how many families were murdered, how many families were deported. So these, I've made these benches. Um, they're all slightly mended. They have a sort of kintsugi, a bit of gold on them. And these are my sort of Stolpersteiner. They're my stumble steps. You cannot miss them. You know, here we are in the most civilized city in the world, a city that does not acknowledge what happened to its Jewish population. This is a family house. Uh, I've repopulated it. And I have to say a week ago, I, I looked back, um, the house, it was the opening, the house was filled with people, all the lights were on, there were children running around, there were members of the family, there were uh, art historians and curators, there were artists. And I had this absolutely astonishing feeling, uh, you know, really astonishing feeling, Christian, that, 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 you know, that places and objects, you know, can be restituted, you can bring things back, you can find agency in places and retell stories and do stuff. You know, it's, it's what you do in the museum, Tristram, but this is but what, also, I, what, you know, what I was trying to do in Paris. This, in, this incredible journey though, thinking to connect this work with your previous work, if we think of the kind of, the, the demand for, the state glory from yeah. Augustus, the geopolitics of Wedgwood yeah. taking on China um, with his pottery, and then the, the elegance and the delicateness and the privacy of, 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 of the porcelain you're placing back in, in, in those spaces and how, and how those objects, so different to the kind yes. of, um, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the sort of state um, confrontations um, ha have a different feel, and and I think it's in. I think that you know we're, we're sometimes led down paths saying no, this is just a kind of connoisseurial conversation, and actually these are intensely yeah. Yeah. Uh, emotional and important yeah. and powerful conversations with implications for today, based around the, the potency of objects. Exactly, and and you know that's it. I absolutely. I absolutely agree. And I think that it's, it's you know, there's somewhere in the hair with amber eyes. I, I've, I'm not going to reread that book, but somewhere I say it's how you tell the stories that matters, you know. It, and it, you know, it, they are complicated stories, but damn it, you know, they need the energy. You need to go back. You need to go back and start again. Like you've, you've done that with Wedgwood. You've said this is a radical man. I mean, you've done that cogently and passionately we need to do that you know in, in in with with all these places all these elided and effaced stories as well we really do is it, we, we've got to get to work and, and suddenly a space which for many parisians yeah. was a sort yeah. of beautiful but elegant times capsule in which yeah. they could luxuriate yeah. in in a family history and a past which was tragic but also kind of lost well actually there's an an, an an immediacy and an importance and a relevance to, mm. to what happens in contemporary paris yeah. explored through a reinterpretation well th isn't that the perfect moment to finish reinterpretation isn't that what we're about it's exactly that's exactly what we're about 
reinterpretation the power of the power of wonder of objects I, and I, thank you so Tristram, much it's a it's a huge pleasure always to be in conversation honestly Tristram, thank you thank you for that thank you thank you from me and on behalf you, of all the people who are going to be visiting you um i i do think that was just such an eloquent double act um and you 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 brought it was so compelling and you brought to life the 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 search for the secrets of of porcelain um and all its multiple manifestations from wedgwood's um abolitionist medallion edward um to your exhibition um just you know just mounted last week um so you know in in real time um your exhibition at the musee nisim de commando um so thank you both so much um before we finally end um i would like to recommend to everybody both your books um this is tristram's the um the biography of Josiah Wedgwood, the radical potter. And here is Edmund's letters to Commando. Um, so thank you very much for and for leaving us really with a sense of the emotional potency of the power of objects. Um, I'd like to recommend to everybody as well as the books that the first opportunity you visit the Victorian Albert Museum in London and if you've got any chance of getting to Paris between now and May you'll be able to see Edmund's exhibition at the Musée Nissim de Commando.